Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Art Ocal, here with you every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. Boy, the mascots are mad at us, Wish. They're very mad. Well, I mean, it's our <laughs> fault for calling something like mascot madness. I think calling it that portends that someone will be mad at us at some point. But the mascots <laughs> are fired up. We, we have our full bracket of all the NHL teams and their mascots, including Rempe the Giant of the New York Rangers. <laughs> and we will, at the end of the show, give you the results of the first round matchups in that uh, intense tournament uh, that, let's face it, Arda, uh, created a lot of buzz around the mascot community, as well as NHL fans, as well as furries, probably. Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. Multiple <laughs> communities involved in mascot <laughs> madness. Shout out to the likes of Chance and Howler and NJ Devil uh, and Victor E. Green. Many mascots uh, participating in you know, the uh, in the discourse online. That's for sure. You know what struck me? Like uh, I was going, I, I tweeted out all the matchups so people could vote on them, and the fan yes. vote will factor into a lot of these decisions. But not definitive, though. I want to be clear on that. Yeah. yeah, it will be a factor. And as I went through all the handles, I was struck by how many of the mascots follow me on on Twitter. Oh. <laughs> like, like, too, like too many of them do. And then there's a couple that don't. And I was just sort of perturbed by it. I'm like, what did I do to you, Chance the Gila Monster, besides say that you were a mediocre mascot? Like what, Sabretooth, I think the Sabres mascot doesn't follow me. And I was very perturbed by that. I go back to the, the old Puck Daddy blog days. I'm like, I put all of you guys over for the most part, except for that Oilers one. I think I was one of the reasons why people uh, treated the Oilers one like it was uh, scaring kids. Yeah. It's, and, it's, the, it's and, the thing that and, I and helped that's establish. Why, yeah. and that's why the Oilers <laughs> mascot has you blocked. Probably. Uh, anyhow, we will Probably. we will we will get to that later in the show. And also the great John Butchergrass will join us to talk college hockey. Uh, congratulations to Ohio State winning the women's college hockey national championship. It was a rematch from last year. It was one nothing Wisconsin last year. It was one nothing Ohio State this year. Both teams running it back and Ohio State winning the national championship. Uh, for the second time in three years. So congratulations to them. Bucci will break down the men's bracket as well uh, as the selection show was on Sunday. But let's talk winners and losers from the weekend. Uh, an easy place to start in the Mile High City Wish. Nathan McKinnon, baby. 34th straight game with a point at home for the Colorado Avalanche, closing in on Wayne Gretzky's record of 40 straight games with a point at home. Uh, set back in the 80s. The Avalanche have won nine games straight. I watched most of that uh, Colorado-Pittsburgh game uh, on Sunday afternoon. And here, here's the question I'll ask you, uh, Arda. Does Nathan McKinnon have a claim to be the best all-around player in the NHL at this point? Yes. Today. As okay. we, uh, in, in 2024, yes. Sound offensively, responsible and dangerous defensively. He's very fast. He's excellent with the puck. He's clutch. How many yeah. times have we seen him that score late third period goals to tie? Like he, by the way, he scored the goal uh, to tie the game. They were down four nothing against the Penguins on Sunday. They yeah. come all the way back, and McKinnon's the guy that scores the fourth goal to, to send it to overtime. And then, uh, and then yeah. you know, sets up Duran for, for a beautiful goal as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So I made the argument a few years ago on ESPN.com that McKinnon was the best all-around player in the league and, and had some supporting evidence and had some teammates kind of say it. And obviously, if we're talking about this debate, it's him versus McDavid versus versus Matthews at this point is probably what we'd say, right? I mean, Kale McCarr, I think, is probably in the conversation, too, if you wanted to include defensemen. I think that's fair. Um, the thing about McKinnon that I keep coming back to, and you just pointed it out in that Penguins uh, game, is... As great as McDavid is, and as great as Matthews is, and as great as McCarr is, I don't know if there's a player in the league right now that can assert his will on a game and get that proverbial cliche sports eye of the tiger thing going on and just will his team to victory in the way that McKinnon does. I mean, he, we, we all said the same thing when they won the cup, which is that that was McKinnon's cup. Like that was him having laid the groundwork, him giving the interviews saying that losing is no longer an option. The will of Nathan McKinnon uh, powered the avalanche of that cup win. Yes. And when you watch a game like we watched on Sunday with the Penguins and the, and the avalanche, there is that point of differentiation, I think, between McKinnon and the other superstars that are in the conversation of best all around player in the NHL. 
where he just has that extra gear. And again, I hate to be the McDavid hasn't won, so he doesn't want to win or some nonsense like that guy. But you watch McKinnon and it's the moments in which he's doing the things he does that make you just in awe of how good he is. One category he definitely leads is who has the most Mamba mentality in the NHL. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's it's Nathan McKinnon. That's a really good comparison, man. Like there there are other NBA players that you know are in the conversation for talent, but it's like it was when Kobe did did what he did. It was the yes. timing of it all, on top of being the most incredibly skilled player. And McKinnon's just got that right now. And and what he's doing with this home point streak is remarkable. The Avalanche being where they are right now, as far as like. Rolling. And by the way, I mean, they're, they're still not clear of Dallas. <laughs> if, we're, if we're talking about like the big dog in the West or the big dog in the NHL, like there are other teams in the conversation. But McKinnon just like every time you watch him, you're like, I know McDavid pound for pound, probably the most skilled player that we have in the world. But McKinnon, man, I mean, when he's yeah. on it and when he's got it and when he wants it, he, he might be the best all around player in the NHL. He, uh, he cleared 122 points on the season as well in that game, uh, yeah. which sets a record for Avalanche franchise history for most points in a season. Uh, that's, give us a that's, that's, I mean, that's only because Forsberg played during the trap years and couldn't stay healthy. I still think Forsberg might be the most talented player the Avalanche have ever had in their roster. Personally. Wow. Well, yeah. We can't get into that conversation right now. We, we no, got, we we got more to talk about. Lo uh, loser. Uh, Western Conference playoff race, dude. It feels like we were only about a week ago on this very podcast being like, it's, it's crazy, it's bonkers, what's going to happen? Well, what happened is that the St. Louis Blues are the only team that has a greater than 3% chance of making the Western oh Conference playoffs. As we do the show today, they do have a, a game coming up that could affect those odds, I'm sure. But the Predators, Kings, Golden Knights, as of Monday per Stathletes, all have a better than 93% chance of making the playoffs. At this point, it's seeding. And look, man, like we just talked about with the Avalanche, with the Stars, with the Jets, like seeding is still dramatic. Seeding is still important. We don't quite know how it's all going to work out and what the first round matchups are going to be. But we kind of, at this point, are to have an idea who the teams in that first round are going to be in the West, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, which is the opposite of the East, which could very well come down to game 82 because that second wild card spot is basically hot potato, but in reverse. Uh I'll take this winner, Zach Hyman. Uh, what a season he is having. Uh, obvious, look, I get it. A lot of people are going to be like, yeah, I could score goals if I was uh, uh, playing with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, blah, 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 blah. The guy has improved every single season he has been with the Edmonton Oilers, and now he reaches the 50-goal mark. And I just want to point out one thing. Did you see how he got mobbed when he scored that 50th yeah. goal? Like. His teammates loved it for him. He is a well-respected, affable guy, and his teammates were extremely happy for him. The fans were, too. Like, you could just see the vibe was immaculate when he scored that 50th goal. So good on him. Yeah, not bad for a former fifth-round pick. It's like he said to Sportsnet after the game, he said, if you do good things every day, good things are going to happen. Hockey in life is a roller coaster. There are ups and downs. If you're always positive, things usually go your way. And that's the thing he brings that Oilers room, which probably isn't always very positive, as we'll get to in a second. Um, but listen, I saw somebody mention this morning that maybe Zach Hyman should be nominated for the Masterton Trophy for perseverance in hockey, which I guess is the idea of like being the age he is, being the draft pick that he was. Uh, and getting a 50 goal season at this stage in his career. You mentioned it before, Arda. I'm I'm not trying to rain on the guy's parade. He deserves a winner spot in this in this ranking. A 50 goal season is incredible for anybody in this league. 39. 39 of the 50 goals were assisted by either McDavid, Dreisaitl, or both. I I I think I think you and I could get get at least 25. Um, that's all I'm saying. If if I'm if I'm parked in front of the net and I'm not bullied out of that position, I could get 10. <laughs> I think I could score 10 goals. McDavid and, and putting again, it on I'm, my I'm stick. Not, I'm not trying to bemoan stick it, Stick on the ice. An incredible season. And, and there is something to be said for, you know, becoming the Chris Kunitz to Connor's Sidney Crosby at this stage in your career. Like, it's awesome. It's great. He's great for that team. It's great for Zach Hyman. Um, but the idea that, like, the perseverance of a guy who you know, happened to score like 130 some odd goals with McDavid the last three seasons. I don't, I don't quite know if that's the definition of perseverance for me. Make, uh, a new, make a new award. Make it the Good Vibes Award. Give it to Zach Hyman. There you go. I love that idea. The Good Vibes Award. award. <laughs> the, 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 we'll call it the Hurdle Trophy. Um, yes. Yes. 
loser the rest of the Oilers. Oh my God, what are we? Are we? Are we sure they're okay? <laughs> they lost two straight games, uh, both uh, pretty bad losses uh, to the Ontario teams. Three of their last five. Um, they've gotten a wee bit leaky defensively lately. They're twenty second in expected goals against at five on five since March seventh. Even though they're eleventh in save percentage, they were fourth in expected goals against from March first through March from February first rather through March sixth. So, th- th- someone said the other day to me on Twitter like that they're reverting back to their December form. I don't think we're quite there yet. But there's definitely look at let me put it this way. You'd rather be the Avalanche at this point in the way that they're playing than be the Edmonton Oilers in the way that they're playing at this point as we get close to the playoffs. Sure, fair enough. But listen, there's still a little bit of time before the start of the playoffs. I'm not that concerned about the Oilers. I'm sure, you know, let's talk about this when they're in game two or game three of their first round and they're still playing like this. That then yeah. then we can uh sound the alarms. Uh I, I said it before, winner Ohio State. Congratulations to that program. Uh two championships in three years. Coach Nidi Mazarol uh set the record actually for most franchise wins uh, most program wins in school <laughs> history uh this this season as well the the, the the nil has turned these teams from schools to, to franchises, the franchises That's exactly. Um, exactly yeah joy dunn game winner in the third uh uh reagan kirk uh 26 save shutout performance fantastic stuff from the buckeyes goalie either ohio state or wisconsin has won the women's frozen four in each of the last five years are mm-hmm. yeah a, a heck of a run between those two, it's uh, a, it's, it's it's a Canada versus USA esque kind of rivalry that's brewing in women's college hockey at the national level, which is uh, which should is we get cool. o- should we get Ohio State and Wisconsin women's teams playing as the uh, prelude to the uh, to the uh, game at the Horseshoe next year? Oh my gosh, between, that'd be amazing between the Blue Jackets and but Red Wings. I mean, know I know what? it doesn't sync up as that... Michigan Ohio State, but the game, the quality of this game might be better than that. No, but that's a great idea. Yeah. For everything you just said, why not have them? That is a that yes, that we should lobby for that. Do I want to see Ohio State versus Wisconsin almost like a like 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 it's just like a like the match, you know, Undercard. like how you have like a yeah, like how you have like just like a like a feature matchup. Yeah, that's your feature matchup. Absolutely. It's almost like the 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 last two national championships. These two teams are going to be here in a special exhibition matchup. Or if there's a way to make it count somehow. I mean, they did play five times before yeah. the national championship. If there's a way to make it count. Oh, gosh, that'd be amazing. I, I think the schedule makers can work something out, but that'd be really dope. And I mean, make it make it a celebration of, of Ohio State hockey and uh, and go from there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Loser. Loser. Uh, fan, fans of women's hockey were the big winners. Fans of appeals were the big loser. Uh, mm. Source informed me on Sunday I reported that uh, Washington Capitals forward Tom Wilson decided not to appeal his six-game suspension for a high stick to the head of Toronto Maple Leafs forward Noah Gregor. Uh, the Department of Player Safety suspended Wilson on Friday for six games. There was a lot of uh, talk that he would probably appeal it, considering the NHLPA had become real appeal friendly this season, appealing uh, suspensions that were even less than six games. It was going to go to Bettman, then it was going to go to the neutral arbitrator, and it's going nowhere instead. A um, couple of things about the suspension that I thought I found pretty interesting. Uh, one being that the Capitals, the sense I get is that they thought it was going to be a lot worse, Arda. Like, I think they were thinking maybe like double digits based on mm. uh, Wilson's history with player safety. But You know, as there's always a bit of education in these rulings and the education this time was that Tom Wilson's previous suspensions were all kind of in the same lane. You know, it was legal checks to the head, hits from behind, you know, that kind of thing, physicality kind of thing. And and so they were all building on each other to get exponentially longer. Um, This was his first stick foul that rose to the level of suspension. And so they're going to acknowledge his history. But it's kind of a different thing. If if you think about why we have the Department of Player Safety, Arda, the principal uh, function of it, according to Brendan Shanahan, who founded it, was changing the behavior of players. So, you know, Tom Wilson hadn't been in in in, in trouble with player safety since I think May 2021, if I'm right on that. Okay. And so you can say that it did make a difference in the way that he played. On this one, he clearly screwed up. It was reckless, if not intentional. So his history plays into it, but it doesn't necessarily build on the previous suspensions because they were in a different category than this one. Yeah. Um, I will say this too about the ruling. If you go back and watch the video, Arda, mm-hmm. uh, they are very explicit in the video to talk about what this play was not. And they talk about how it was not two players that were engaged at the time. 
uh, in like a battle in front of the net. They talked about how, you know, when Wilson hit him with his stick, he wasn't like slipping and falling. Uh, these are Easter eggs for those of us who watch these videos because they are speaking directly to the Jacob Truba, Trent Frederick mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. earlier this season. And I can tell you as a matter of fact that that Truba play was used as evidence in the defense of Tom Wilson in the hearing. And I ex imagine it's going to be used by anybody else that is guilty of a stick foul going forward. And player safety has is establishing right now the difference between that play, which people were very upset, wasn't a longer a big suspension for Truba, and what we see uh, guys like Wilson do in their, in their infractions. And I like that then. In that case, I like yeah. it because you're saying if this is your if this was your defense, here's why we don't accept it. Here's our rebuttal, and therefore, and and quite frankly, I I expected more too. So yeah, it's like this whole like, situation. Like the, I I accept this whole situation is what I'm. Saying. It's it's almost like because it was true, but they should have done a video explaining why it wasn't a suspension. But instead, they're kind of like, or or, or why it wasn't you know a, a bigger punishment. Like now, they're I feel like they're kind of like going back and 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 seeding these things through their explanations of other situations to let people know why Truba was what it was and and why this was what what it was for Wilson. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's go back to we talked about Ohio State a couple minutes ago winning the Women's National Championship. How about we focus our attention now to the men's Frozen Fours coming up, regionals coming up. The selection show was on Sunday. That was hosted by the great John Buchagross, and he joins us right now on The Drop. Joining us now on The Drop, it's college hockey, se college hockey season. Uh, the NCAA Division I men's tournament begins this week, which means it is time. No time like the present to bring on our good friend, John Bucci-Grass, to talk about the NCAA <laughs> tournament, a little bit of NHL as well. Bucci, Boston University and Boston College have met in the NCAA men's hockey final since 1978 when Miracle on Ice defenseman Jack O'Callaghan was playing for BU. Uh, <laughs> BC's number one, BU's number two. Is this the year we could see these two college hockey titans face off for the championship? <laughs> Well, Jack O'Callaghan, why do you play college hockey? That's the whole inspiration for college hockey, the, the line in the movie Miracle. He's doing it obvious for the girls. So, uh, so yeah, um, there's, well, the bracket is set up that way, Greg. Obviously, one overall seed, two overall seeds, so they're opposite sides. And uh, BU's going to South Dakota to begin the tournament this weekend, and BC is in their backyard in Providence, Rhode Island, not very far from Boston at all. So it's possible. BC is certainly a cut above the rest of the country. Um, BC, uh, BU is right there. But as we know, the best team always doesn't win tournaments, a.k.a. the 1980 Olympic Games, because uh, it's one and done. It's not a series. You know, it's hard to beat a good team four out of seven or three out of five. Easier two out of three and certainly easier one out of one. So, you know, we could have that. It's possible and um, because they probably are. Uh, the two best teams in college hockey, although it's BC, I think is grouped with uh, a few more teams or BC is just a little bit above. Yeah. We'll get to BC in a second, but uh, let's drill down on BU for a, for a moment here. Obviously, Macklin Celebrini is a name that every fan of a terrible NHL team knows quite well by now as the, uh, <laughs> as, as probably the first overall pick he's ranked as the top number one uh, prospect by central scouting in North America right now. Uh, he's been a force this season for BU. Uh, how would you rank him right now on the scale of generational talent to NHL star? Where, where do you see Celebrini kind of uh, 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 projecting right now in the NHL? Certainly minimum NHL star for sure. Yeah, he will definitely be the first pick. So when we have the draft lottery in May, it will be for Macklin Celebrini. Every organization won't wants him it's really interesting greg whoever gets him and let's assume the bottom four will one of the bottom four san jose chicago anaheim columbus he's going to be immediately paired with another quasi generational or in my mind hall of fame talent and that is certainly fantilli carlson um and Connor bedard now san jose is will smith we don't know about will smith yet he's also in college like macklin celebrini happens to lead the country in scoring by a nice gap he was the sharks fourth overall pick last year so either way wherever he goes he's going to be buffered it's almost like a malkin crosby situation i don't think it's quite that high obviously crosby's crosby and malkin's always been a little underrated generationally uh, for his amazing talent especially when he was younger 
quicker because he added all that skill with size and reach. That gives you that little bit extra uh, secret sauce when you're, you know, you're six two, six three, six four. He's yet to play in a league where he's older than most of the people in the league. You know, that'll start happening when he's, you know, 23, 24, 25 in the NHL. So to be 17 years old for the entire season, he'll be 17. Some guys turn it in the fall. That's what usually happens. Like Jack Eichel, he turned it 18 in the fall at BU. So, yeah, but I think I'm bullish on him because of how he plays, his spirit, his aggressiveness, how he plays so fast. And he's a goal scorer, too. You know, yeah. You yeah, know some sure. of these guys are amazingly talented, but can they score? The most important stat in hockey is scoring goals. He's got 31. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned Will Smith and BC. I, I, I found I was up in in uh, in Boston recently doing some stories on both BU and BC, and the kid line, obviously with Ryan Leonard and Gabe Pro mm. and Will Smith, uh, they were a star for the U.S. Junior uh, uh, team that that won World Juniors. Uh, they've been together for a lot of the season in BC as well. And one of the yeah. reasons why uh, they are where they are. But the guy I wanted to ask you about is is Cutter Gautier. I mean, now this is a guy who led the nation in goals and also led the nation in pissing off Flyers fans. Uh, <laughs> what, what did you make of that split with Philly? And 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 how do, yeah. how have you seen him play this year? How do you think he uh, projects in the NHL? Yeah, very odd, the thing in Philadelphia. I know he's an Arizona kid, and I don't know if he directed to get to Anaheim, you know, being close to Arizona uh, exactly. And and that was his only spot to go. And Dan Greer's uh Hands were tied, but I heard he had a chance to go to Colorado too. And there was a Bo Byram trade that could have been happening there, um, mm. which is very interesting. And I, I think that might have been, a, you know, maybe a better trade for the Flyers. It's, it's my yeah. opinion. Um, yeah. So, but no, I am again bullish on this kid. He's a big, thick winger who can skate and shoot. He's got a nose for the net. Again, in the next league, when you go up against Eric Chernak and he's flashing your wrist, and you go up against Victor Hedman, you go against some of these monsters every night. Um, you know, do guys have the appetite for that? As we know, some guys do, no matter what their size. Martin St. Louis in the Hall of Fame because he was fearless around the net. And you, no matter what size you are, you have to have an appetite for cross checks, slashes. Now, it's not quite what it was, as we know, 25 years ago, but others still a little bit of that. But no, overall, and again, he's going to get paired with either a McTavish, Salabrini, or Carlson when yeah. he comes in the league next year, which is going to be great for him. So I like how these young guys are in a good place. Like we're seeing what the Bears are doing with Caleb Williams, giving him a support staff when he enters the league. That's so important. And these these guys in the draft this year and Cutter Goche are going to have that as well. Yeah. Are you, are you calling uh, Trevor Zegras Justin Fields when when? Uh, <laughs> <Gauthier> <laughs> yes, shows? I love that. Is, is he is he all flash and dash and he's gone by the time uh, yeah. Gauthier joins the Ducks? Um, I think they're definitely I think they're definitely going to move them because they have too many centers. And uh, I don't know if Pat Verbeek meshes with them, but I'm very bullish. I continue to be bullish on Trevor Zegers. I think he has a Pavel Datsuk ceiling once he slowly matures in terms of hands. When your hands are so good offensively, they should be good defensively. Right. And that's, yeah. that's what Datsuk was. And that's that's what Evgeny Malkin was on the wall. He could strip guys with the puck turnover, pass, score, goal. And that's what he does as a young man, especially. He still does it now, but especially as a young man. I think once Zegers learns that, he, he can have that kind of game. Wow, every every Red Wings fan in our in our listening audience right now calling up Eiserman's office, get us Zegers. Right. He's the That'd new be a good spot for him. Yeah, because um, they need and, and, skill. And he can get there. Yeah, they do have a spot for him. And, and that's who didn't peak until he was 27, 28. People forget that Zegers is still that's like true kid, too. 21, 22. That's true too. Um, you you unveiled the bracket uh, for the NCAA men's hockey tournament. Who are a couple of the players that you would be you're fascinated to see in this tournament that? Uh, that maybe either you've got not gotten eyes on or you're just interested to see how they react in a pressure situation like this. Well, I got the Providence Regional with Colby Cohen, which I'm really excited about. First of all, the great city, great Italian restaurants. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, especially with the off day now. You know, they have doubleheader off day game before they were just back to back. Now we have that whole Saturday. We got to entertain ourselves. So we'll do that. But I'm glad because, you know, Boston College is there. So I, I like to meet these kids in person. Um, I like to get a feel for their personalities. I, I, like, I like to look at their, you know, at their physical stature. How big are they? Do they have big legs? Do they have skinny legs? Do they have, you know, how do they react? And I love that part. We get to go down on Wednesday night and then Thursday we meet with all the teams, about four or five players for each of the four teams uh, in my regional. And again, so for BC, Smith and Leonard and Perot and Goche, they'll be there in a room at a table and I get to talk to them and get a feel for their personality. And again, like I said, get an idea. How big are their arms? How big are their ribs? Like, are they big, strong guys? Are they frail? They need to wait for a little bit. Maybe maybe stay in school an extra year and, and gain another 10 pounds of muscle, which college allows you to do that because you play two games a week. Then you can work out all during the week. 
So I'm looking forward to those guys, uh, um, you know, for, for that reason. So to be in that region and then onto the Frozen Four, those guys especially. You know, I'd like to see Mac again. I haven't met Macklin Celebrini yet in person. So if we get to the final four, we do that again. All four teams the day before come with us to coach four players, coach four players, coach four players, coach four players. And so I'd like to meet some of those BU kids as well. Boston College, BU, your top two seeds, Denver three, Michigan State four. Do you have a dark horse team in mind that you think could, like you mentioned earlier, upset the apple cart and and create a situation where one of these favorites doesn't win the tournament? Yeah, I think, again, all the blue buds are back. That's really exciting. Michigan State's a one seed. They can win it. Denver's a one seed. They can win it. Michigan, obviously, in the weeds a little bit. Not quite a one seed, but loaded with future NHL talent. Uh, talent. Gavin Brindley will be Adam Fantilli's line mate maybe next year um, in Columbus. So uh, it, it's fun to to see these kids. So, yeah, North Dakota is there as well as a two seed. Um, Jason Blake's son, Jackson, one of the best players in the country. So that's really cool. So, yeah, a lot of the Blue Bloods are really back. NIL money kind of helped that. It kind of brought back those guys again. And now with the transfer portal, a kid can go to a small school, kind of pop. A big school can swoop in and give them money. And that's yeah. just the way it is with college basketball, college hockey. So, But in terms of a, tr so a true dark horse, if I had to pick one, for me, it's Maine. All they right. gave BU a pretty good. Yeah, they gave they gave BU a good matchup in the semifinal. Ben Barr is a really good coach. He was on the staff, of course, with Providence and UMass at one Natties. And uh, I, what he's done, he's brought fire. That's a great program. Paul Korea. They travel well, like North Dakota does. So uh, I'm really looking forward to Maine. They get to play in Springfield to begin the tournament, so they're going to have some fans there. Um, so I Maine's the one team they play abrasively and fast. And if they get saves, I think they're a team that can get to the final four. I think they could come out of Springfield. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. Um, all right, yes. finally, you are famous for many reasons, Bucci. Um, oh, but thank one, you. But one is definitely for having gotten on that Alex <laughs> Ovechkin will break Gretzky's career record goals mark thing mm. before anybody else did. You wrote you even wrote a story about it on ESPN.com yes. saying it was 2010. I know, I know. Ago. You were so ahead of the curve. What have you made of <laughs> Ovi's roller coaster season this year for the Capitals? It's like buying Apple stock at 12, you know, 10 <laughs> years ago. My goodness. Although oh, that makes you rich. This does not make me rich. Um, but yeah, it was really <laughs> interesting at, at the beginning of the year, watching him play hockey. He looked so disinterested. He wasn't moving at all. And a, a, a few things went through my mind. I'm thinking, okay, new coach. And he, a new coach kind of affects him. He's trying to take it all in, wants to be a good teammate. He's always been a good teammate. He gets more excited when other people score than when he scores. I love that quality about Ovechkin. Um, you know, new stick new coach. Maybe he's thinking, you know what? I might be a little out of shape here. I better ease my way into the season. Maybe I can't go hard for 82. So, you know, we've, we've heard that great story about NHL players play about 85, 90% during the regular season. That's the key uh, to be consistent, stay healthy, play all 82 and then come playoff time. Of course, it's, it's absolute pedal to the metal. So maybe he was just trying to think, I, I can't go hard 82. Let me try to get a few freebies here. And, uh, and he had no luck at all, no puck luck off the one-timers, you know, with the power play. Uh, but then you can see he's just a different man since the All-Star break. He, I think he realized this is a little bit embarrassing. I got to get going. I got to play playoff intensity. And now you add the fact his team's trying to make the playoffs. Yeah. That only helps us because because he's trying to drag. I think the, I think you might have used that line, which was a great line. He's trying to drag them into the playoffs with him. And yeah. that's a, and he's really showing some captain leadership. You know, he really is. And uh, so now he's back. And, you know, he's back on track now. And he should get it. I don't. I don't think he'll get it next year. I thought it was going to be kind of medium to late year after next. Now it looks like it might be early to medium year after next. Yeah. Um. You know, either twenty five or twenty six late. So, so he's going to do it. There's no doubt about it. Even earlier this year, people were writing columns as he washed up. Ferraro was texting me, "Your boy's washed up. He's finished. <laughs> he can't move." Come on, he's thirty eight. Yager <laughs> played till he was forty five. Gordy played till he was fifty. Eventually, hey. he'll stop drinking Pepsi-Cola on the bench in the water bottles. Eventually, he'll start working out in the summer. Eventually, he'll lose 15 pounds, I think, and then really uh, you know, go for 1,000 goals. That's what always, that's always been my case. Hey, I think he should go for 1,000 goals. In Ray's, in Ray's defense, Brian McClellan was, was, had this, the crap scared out of him, too, that he had hit the wall. I bet, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it didn't like, look good. It didn't yeah, look good. Was, they were a little bit worried about coasting. this guy. But yeah, it was, I, I mean, knew listen, he was as, coasting. As, as we've talked about many times, like for the good of the game to have this be our, you know, uh, uh, Hank Aaron home run race or, our, yeah, our, yeah. you know, Cal Ripken, uh, Lou Gehrig streak thing. Like this is the thing where everybody in sports pays attention to hockey for a good couple of weeks when it gets close to Gretzky. And so I was thrilled yeah. to see you continue to be correct and that OB <laughs> continues to be uh, in the chase for Gretzky's record. Um, 
Bucci, you're the best. Everybody check out his work during the tournament and follow him on Thank Twitter, you. obviously, for uh, all the NCAA hockey stuff uh, because he is the man when it comes to college hockey. Bucci, thanks for joining the drop, man. It's almost time for that season, too. Very busy this time of year. Very, Thank very. you, Greg. Take care. Thank you to Bucci for joining us here on The Drop. Let's get to Mascot Madness. 32 Woo! teams, 32-ish mascots. <laughs> uh, we ranked them, we ordered them, we seeded them, and the first round matchups were posted for all of you to vote. Now, the vote is not definitive. Whoever won the vote on Wish's Twitter, that certainly sways our opinion. But I want to be right. clear, for every single round, that is only a factor that is only a part of the entire equation. Wish and I, if necessary, will debate every single matchup or at least come to a consensus. So let's go through these. There's a lot to get to. So we're going to have a little less debate this round than other rounds. Yeah. Uh, so in the weird stuff division, Wish, yeah. Gritty versus UP, Gritty won 77% of the vote. Any issue of Gritty moving on here? No issue there. One, because Gritty, uh, Gritty along with the Stanley Cup are the two most famous things about the National Hockey League at this point. And also, UP is a baseball mascot. Let's be quite honest here. Uh, I think that definitely goes in the favor of Gritty in that one as well. Yeah, I would say Gritty moves on here. I do I do uh, wish UP had a better first round matchup here, but Gritty is just a juggernaut. So unfortunately uh, for the Habs fans listening, UP out in the first round and Gritty moves on. Sparky the Dragon versus Stormy. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes mascot won 60% of the vote. What say you? I'm okay with that because quite frankly, I think the Islanders, we had to go with Sparky because Sparky is still the, the primary mascot of the Islanders, but uh, Niles, NY Isles, mm -hmm. the... Mm -hmm. uh, surly uh red bearded lumberjack uh to me is is as good or maybe even better than sparky so the, the outers have a two mascot problem as opposed to a three body plot problem currently on netflix uh i go stormy in this one arda we could have done a free bird rule where it could have been Sparky <laughs> or Niles, and we don't know which one is going to be competing in each round. Niles has been present, by the way. I saw Very uh, Niles yeah. uh, at the Isles. It was a Hurricanes Islanders game at UBS Arena that I was at, and uh, Niles and Sparky were both there. So uh, they are doing a sort of uh, kind of tandem tag team combination. But yes, they are out. We were, both, we were both at that Islanders-Carolina game, and it may be the Islanders because they've subsequently then lost the Devils. But Car Carolina with Gensel and Kuznetsov, man. Oh, boy. Ooh. That is a good hockey team. Yeah. I don't know, man. And it they could are, be the year. Are, it oh could be gosh. the year. And honestly, they look – both of them look great. Yeah, Like in, in that lineup. Oh, my gosh. And the vibes are immaculate apparently in the locker room. Like everything is clicking for them. Uh, okay. Seattle Kraken, Bowie versus Dallas Stars, Victor E. Green. Now, this was a close vote. Bowie did edge out Victor E. Green in the Twitter vote, 52.3%. Now, as I mentioned when we announced this, the mascot's participation and willingness to win and their pitches to us could absolutely sway our votes. Victor E. Green has been one of the most vocal among <laughs> all the mascots in the NHL to win the entire competition wish. Yeah. I admire that gumption. Mm -hmm. I admire that ambition, determination, and quite frankly, that stick to itiveness yeah. to want to win this whole thing. So for me, despite the fact that Bowie edged out Victory Green in the vote, it was close. I'm going with Victory Green on this one. The Nathan McKinnon of Fuzzy Green Aliens. I mean, that's what you're basically saying. I give it to Victory Green as well. The Tampa Bay Lightning Thunderbug <laughs> taking on the Columbus Blue Jackets Stinger. Also another pick 51.5%. Who do you have? Even Let's just put the vote aside here because it was really split down the middle, essentially. Who would you have winning well, in this matchup? Look, I'm, I'm always going to be a Thunderbug guy, uh, and mainly in this matchup because I feel like Stinger is inherently um, not as effective a mascot as the giant phallic cannon the blue jackets used to have <laughs> back mm. in the day i will always be more of a boomer man than a stinger man that being said i think this is close enough where i would revert to the fan vote i don't know about you yeah this is a tough one for me like that this one is where my loyalty is for sale wish 
Uh, I uh, there is an image. Uh, there is a photo on Getty Images of me sitting on uh, Stinger's knee okay. uh, as part of a giant mascot collection during the uh, mascot showdown. Uh, that that uh, the the game that they play at All Star. Uh, so that that photo exists. But then Thunderbug recently had me at Star Wars night, and I was part of his skits, and I was one of the beekeepers. I I actually was one of the uh, part of the bug team wish. So I don't know who to like. Who do I choose in these scenarios? I don't know. Do I go recency? Do I go uh, being uh, immortalized on Getty Images? I don't know. Sometimes you sometimes you say things in this show, and I feel like I'm on ketamine. Like I, <laughs> everything you just said feels like a fever dream. I, again, I I think we got to go with the fan vote and go with Stinger here. All right, Stinger edges out Thunderbug. Big loss for uh, for the Lightning and Thunderbug. Uh, but yes, yeah, Stinger moves on. All right, the Birds and Aquatics division: Tommy Hawk versus Wild Wing. Wild Wing wins a third, uh, two thirds of the vote here. That's a I, I don't know. I was not expecting that. I wasn't uh, Tommy expecting Hawk, either. Tommy Hawk is a number one seed here, but Wild Wing coming in hot. And you know what? I'm kind of inclined to go with the fan vote here. What about I'll, you though? I'll go. Let's go with the fan vote. The massive eight versus one upset. I mean, that is that is on the level of of Oakland over Kentucky right there in March Madness. I, I gotta say though, like I feel like the Blackhawks have obviously moved a little bit ahead in public perception thanks to Connor Bedard, thanks to Kyle Davidson. Uh, but if they can't get over Tommy Hawk, you know, where he only gets a third of the vote, still some work to be done there, I think, in Chicago. Wild Wing, Wild Wing takes this one, I think. So so just like uh, just like Jack Golke, uh, Wild Wing is going to be signing NIL deals with TurboTax and Buffalo Wild Wing. And we're going to yep. see like all these crazy uh, videos on Twitter from uh, from – Wild Wing, uh, who moves on. Congratulations. Huge upset here. Uh, yeah. SJ Sharkey versus Finn the Whale. SJ won 56% of the vote. I'm fine with that. Me too. I love SJ Sharkey, and it also sets up a battle of California in the in the next round between SJ Sharkey and Wild Wing too. I love it. I love the geographical battles. We're good there. Al the Octopus versus okay. Chance the Gila Monster. Mm -hmm. Chance the Gila Monster wins 54.6% of the vote. Chance, I should uh, tell everybody, was also among the most vocal about this tournament. Oh, so a, a Vegas Golden Knights adjacent thing is vocal about something. I've never heard that before. Uh, you know, the only thing about Chance that makes it tricky is that uh, they do have the Golden Knight himself who battles before games. I saw that the Golden Knight himself took a tumble recently in a uh, pregame battle against some specter of some sort. I hope he's OK. Uh, still one. Still one. Still one. Still one. Still one. In this one, I, I'm I'm fine with the results because Al the Octopus is not a plushie. Al the Octopus is a giant statue that descends in the ceiling of the arena. Um so for this case, as much as I have some issue with Chance, my problem with Chance is this. I'll, I'll be honest with you and with, with Chance. Um, the Vegas Golden Knights have an incredible amount of iconography they could rely on to create a mascot. I said this at the time. You've got cards. You've got gambling. You've got the Knights thing. you got the medieval thing. And they went with a Gila monster who kind of looks like uh, an off-brand version of the thing from the Fantastic Four, if I'm being honest. I've mm. never liked Chance. But I like him here to take out Al the Octopus. So what you're saying is you're essentially going to be the chance opposer throughout this entire tournament. You want no, you you are like Bobby the Brain Heenan to any baby face uh, while you are on commentary. You're just going to hate on chance the whole way through and look for reasons for him for chance to lose. Is that what's happening here? No, I, I have to remind you that as a journalist, I'm open-minded. I'm I have a malleable brain. I can al always take in new information and uh, adjust accordingly. Uh, but I will say that uh, that yeah, I expect him to go out in the second round. Okay, we got a lot more matchups here. Iceberg slap shot. Iceberg won sixty three percent of the vote. Uh, I'm okay with Iceberg moving on. Me too. I, I mean, for the sure novelty of having been in sudden death. In the Cats region, Bailey versus Hunter. Bailey took 62.2% of the vote. To me, Bailey moves on. Yeah, I would say so. Hunter scares children. <laughs> You're just happy Hunter is out of the tournament. I, I think we should all be happy. Hunter's you did it. Congratulations. Uh, another mascot that hates you, apparently, Sabretooth, uh, yeah. facing Nash, uh, who won 53% of the vote. Uh, yeah. Any issue with Nash moving on? Not at all. I mean, I, I assume Nash was one of the people that was deprived from seeing you two of the sphere as well. <laughs> so uh, any any good things that can come Nash's way, 
Uh, I think it probably good. And right if there now. was one member of the Predators that would have made it on stage during the U2 concert at the Sphere, it would have been Nash. Yeah, so, absolutely. Shout yeah. out to Nash for taking a picture of the Undertaker Ganesh. once upon a time. Also, Ganesh, yeah, yeah, Kevin Ganesh. Um, <laughs> Sparta Cat versus Stanley C. Panther. Stanley C. Panther takes sixty-two point one percent of the vote. I'm just moving Stanley C. onto the next round. I, I, I think so too. I think Stanley the people C. have spoken. Is... I'm also not a huge Sparta Cat fan. I think they. Senators could have gone in a different direction there, too. All right. Biggest heel of the tournament is Howler. Uh, not happy with us whatsoever that we put a Coyote oh, yeah. in the Cats division. Okay. Yeah, we should uh, Quick this. to remind us that we... uh, Coyote is part of the dog family. Uh, has has a claim. I will say, yes, has a claim. Uh, has a claim uh, is completely right. I mean, we have a full selection community of, my, of me and you and uh, our producers and we put together this bracket in in about 20 minutes and none of us <laughs> none of us noticed that there was a dog in the cat division no nope. so i mean like it's our mistake good on him i mean howler's got a pretty clear path here against these cats now, i will say this uh howler if there's one division that howler would want to be in it's the cat division he can clear out howler can clear out all of the cats. I mean, I think it's like cats and things that look like cats. And I'm sorry. You take a quick glance at the Howler. It kind of looks feline to me. I don't know. Wow. Uh, but but that's fine. We were wrong. Howler's right. And and obviously Howler advances. Yeah. 66% of the vote. In the dogs and wood. <laughs> the best part is we literally have a dogs division. I know. I know. We, uh, we tried, and, we tried uh, to noted... make the numbers work, people. We had tried to make the numbers work. Noted dog, NJ Devil. <laughs> <laughs> number one seed in the dog and woodland creatures division uh won 56 percent of the vote against the imaginary mascot for the new york rangers uh the most hilarious one though rempy the giant I, I gotta say that i was really happy to see the reaction from rangers fans who were like not happy that i mean we're very happy we didn't choose dancing larry and we're we're, we're celebrating <laughs> our innovation of making rempe uh the giant their official mascot that just goes to show you how Rempy Mania, Mania continues to run wild there. But yeah, yes, NJ does. Devil advances. NJ easy. Devil advances by virtue of the fact that NJ really faced nobody in the first round getting a bye. Let's just be honest. Uh, Bruins and Leafs, Blades the Bruin, Carlton the Bear. This was a pick em. Who do you have advancing? I just, it doesn't set well with me to have uh, the Leafs go over the Bruins. I just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense logically. My brain can't process it. I've always been more of a Blades the Bruin fan, but you, you obviously have more of an affinity for Carlton. Tell me why Carlton should win. Because Carlton the Bear is the mascot of the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Leafs need something to hold on to uh, for when they lose to the Bruins in the Fair first enough. round of these playoffs. And, and he won the fan vote, so we'll, we'll put Carlton. And, and, and actually, we're going to invent the story. Uh, the In the vote, uh, Blades was up 4-1 to one in the third period and Carlton <laughs> uh, made an epic comeback <laughs> and won the vote. <laughs> I love it. Writing All hockey right. fables as we go along, sure. Uh, Louie versus Mickey Moose. Great name for the Winnipeg Jets mascot. Won 60% of the vote. Mickey Moose moves on? I mean, sure. I mean, based on the fan vote alone, I I will plead ignorance here, Arda, that until we started this exercise, I had no idea that the Winnipeg Jets mascot was named Mickey Moose. Did you? <laughs> I did actually. I did a Winnipeg Jets event a few years ago, and I and I did learn that. However, sixty percent is an impressive enough uh, vote victory. Absolutely fantastic, Musimba. and 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 by no means is this uh, a factor of us working for Disney. That no, absolutely not. not. No, all. that's not going to factor in on future rounds either. Uh, Bernie the Saint Bernard won fifty five percent of the vote over Harvey the Hound. Uh, Bernie, listen, we can't put over the the Colorado Avalanche for like an hour on this show, and then not give Bernie the win over Harvey the Hound. I mean, the, 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 by virtue of the fact that he's adorable, by virtue of the fact it's the avalanche, uh, by virtue of the fact that I don't want Nathan McKinnon mad at me, uh, Bernie goes over Harvey. Bernie also doesn't eat any junk food, by the way. Strict <laughs> diet. Strict diet for Bernie the St. Bernard. Yeah, it's straight diet of whatever's in that barrel around his neck. Yes, I mean, that's right. Party with Bernie. So the round of 32 is complete. We are now down to the round of 16. We will debate that round on our next episode. Remember, we are here every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well, the NHL on ESPN YouTube. I cannot wait to see what the mascots have to say about the results of the round of 32 and their new matchups in the round of 16. Thank you very much for listening or watching. We will catch you on Friday. Bye.